I'm Ted. I'm Regina. And we're showing you that balancing a ball alone is really easy. OK, now that you've seen that. So if I were to tell our story in three images, it would be like this. So the first image is of me getting ready for my most important podcast, which would happen 40 years later with Regina Holiday. That would end up in the Library of Congress. So Regina and I met because of failure. And this is the image on the back of my jacket you'll see me wearing uh, today. And I want to start with how I entered the medical profession, which is here uh, in Tucson, Arizona. Um, one of the youngest medical schools in the nation, very family practice oriented, collegial, first name basis, um, with the best education, and like many of the health professionals in this audience, paid for by tax dollars. So I was not wanting for anything. This is the medical profession that I found. So I was sent as the medical student representative to the American Medical Association meeting in Chicago in 1991. And what I found there was a profession that was unwilling and unable to deal with a medical crisis um, that I didn't understand and further didn't want to talk to the people that were involved in it. Um, so that meeting, um, many people were arrested. Um, I was inside as a student and we were told to take off our name badges and not talk to anyone outside and be invisible to them. So now I want to show you some images of failure of the profession during that summer. And these are the courtesy of someone I met online, actually. And the thing I remember about being in that hotel during that time was the indifference and really intolerance of the people outside. And not just of them, but of us as well. So it seemed like any new idea was not of interest, and any ideas from the next generation of physicians was not of interest. So I decided, given that I wasn't at a place where I could do very much, the best thing for me to do was observe and remember. And really what I saw inside was, was quite spectacular. Um, I looked up the fate of the person in that photograph, and he actually died this year in 2012. Um, but unfortunately, uh, many, many people died way before then. And so this is the result of that failure. All of this happened before I graduated medical school and got my MD degree. So we look back on that now and to say it was a very scary time for us. Um, but, but what we realize is that there's always people on the edges. And so this population, as Regina will talk about, there are always patients that can benefit. They're on the edge of the healthcare system that we can look out for. And I tend to look out for them. And that's what I learned from that experience. So after medical school, I uh, matched into the best specialty there is, family medicine, of course. Um, and what I was struck by when I started on, on almost the first day was that what physician training was, what we were going to be, were people that would see people only in person, only via telephone, and we would tell them the same information that only we had again and again and again, even though they could get it online themselves, or we wouldn't make it available to them online. I wrote about that uh, many years later, and when I wrote about it, I wrote about what I was thinking at the time, which is this, that we practice in a culture of keeping information to ourselves, and we were very content with that. Um, I finished residency and fellowship, and this is a media story that happened to be, and this is 10 years ago in Seattle. And we were, at the time, looking at ways to involve patients using something called information therapy. And I don't want to give the impression that this is one person changing the world story. It's really not. Because the first thing I did was ask for help. So I was in an organization. I worked with physicians, leaders, nurses, and especially leaders who allowed me to support these private conflicts and public conflicts around whether we could trust patients to have access to their own information. And it was a very fun time, challenging time. But if I didn't have help, um, I wouldn't have succeeded at all. And I think what we were able to do was, I think, kind of impressive. Um, we were the first client of Epic Systems Ambulatory to allow patients and families to see their medical information on the same day that physicians could in the new system. So I want to say to this organization that is implementing the same system, number one, please do the same thing. And number two, it does not, it does not magically happen for you. You actually have to be involved. So before you say they're going to do it for us, you have to be involved as leaders to say, we want this to happen on day one, and don't wait. Um, people that know me know that I'm a fan of the declarative statement, so I tend to say these things like this. Um, and so this is, I found this quote of myself. And what I was trying to do during that time is change the norms around medicine. So every year, we would try and extend what we would share with our patients from normal test results to abnormal test results to more and more and more, which each step was very uncomfortable, but it was important to reset the norms. And during that time, I also discovered social media, because what I realized was that as much as there is information gap between 
our, ourselves and patients. There was one between ourselves and ourselves. So the physicians and nurses that we were serving going through this huge transformational change really were lacking a two-way channel to know what was going on and really what was not going well because in these projects we tend to only give good news. We never send uh, emails out saying we didn't do a good job this week. So a blog was a really great way to do that. And if you notice, one of my first posts was about patient and family access to their information. The thing about this was is that this was all internal because even in 2005, you typically wouldn't tell the world what you were working on or what was a problem. And that seems really weird today, but that's how it was. Um, eventually, the data caught up with us. So now there's good data to show that even in, with a comprehensive electronic medical record, there are gaps. So studies have shown if you take 100 lab test results or 100 imaging test results that are abnormal, about seven of those will not reach the patient in time for follow-up, even with electronic health record. So that's not just poor care, it's devastating care. And the stories on the right from Ireland about a physician that didn't see lab results and the patient died. And this happens uh, more than a minority of times, I'll say. Around this time, I discovered something about myself, which was I tend to live on the edges as well. So this is a photograph from me in a physician leadership course in 2005. I'm the one wearing the uh, white t-shirt, everyone's wearing the blue. And I think maybe I was the last person to recognize this because I looked in my files and I found this photograph 20 years earlier <laughs> with the same image. So I was probably the last person to recognize this about myself, but once I did, uh, I decided to pack up and move from Seattle to Washington, D.C. And so there, I had the revelation that actually when I took this photograph, that this was our medical office. We'd been communicating with the patients online from their home, their office, from where they travel. And I kind of had this, I, it seems obvious today, but the idea is that the medical office is where patients live, work, pray, learn, and play. Um, and it also caused me to start thinking externally. So I started using Twitter. This is my first tweet, very first tweet in 2008. Again, notice the topic. Um, and it's 2012 now, but in 2008, this actually meant telling the world what you were doing. And remember, healthcare was very isolated. If you were to tell your boss, I'm going to write in a public forum about what we're doing, that would not go over very well. So that was a big thing for me to experiment with. And then I met Regina Holiday. And so this is where I realized that all the work I had been doing was advocating within the profession, within ourselves. And I believe the future would be where patients would get involved and get active but I really wasn't active involved with them. So at a small meeting, I took this photograph of her husband's medical record all in paper, which she'll talk about, and, it, and my pupils dilated when I saw that. It was such, a, was such an important image, and to see that Regina was going through this, when he, and she brought this while he was dying. She was still in hospice. I wrote this blog post the next day uh, called, Is It Meaningful If Patients Can't Use It? And this was before meaningful use regulations were published, so before I even knew what that was. And so the idea was, what are we creating electronic health records for if they're only for doctors? Uh, later that year, one of the photographs I took was in the interna of her art was in the international print edition of the British Medical Journal. And from that point forward, I also began to explore using visuals and stories rather than charts and data to motivate people. I was little, and um, that's Regina the girl, and she was in elementary school, and I can notice I have a, a scrape on my chin, and I have this scrape on my chin because I was kicking a ball alone, fell right over on top of it, and throughout my childhood, I had a lot of scrapes and bruises, but some of them were from playing outside, and some of them were not. See, this is the painting that Ted showed you. This is a painting of Ted the boy and Regina the girl, and our eyes looking one direction, our faces looking one direction, and everyone else looking another one because we were non-compliant. We were not necessarily like all of our friends, and that affected the rest of our lives. So it affected Ted's advocacy, and it affected the fact that he's at a medical conference on stage and tweeting right as we speak, and here I am, painting on stage. I'm a mom, I worked at a toy store for years and years, and I married an amazing man. See, when I was little, I had a failure. My first major failure was the fact I could not read. So if you look at this piece of paper here, you'll see there's wonderful text, and I couldn't understand it, but I could understand the pictures, and I could understand the border. There was these amazing borders on the pages, and all these little figures, and my eyes would frolic and dance within the borders and understand that. But my teachers, my teachers would say, well, you need to learn how to read, and A is for apple. Got it? And I said, got it. I'll draw an apple. Well, I know. So I would draw all the time in class, and my teachers would send me to the principal's office. And when I got to the principal's office, I don't know if you know this, the principal often is not there. 
So what would happen is the secretary would hand me crayons and paper, and I'd get to draw. <laughs> and I did this all year. And at the end of first grade, my teacher gave me a piece of paper with a picture of a bee on it in words. And I brought that picture home to my mom, and I said, could you read this to me? And it said, you'll be back. So I would repeat first grade. In my second year of first grade, I would walk the balance beam on the playground by myself. I would bounce balls by myself. And I would find this brick wall and pick up pieces of chalk and shale and, and sandstone. And I would draw. And I would draw all recess. And I would draw out the pain that was in my life. And an entire new year went by. And I still could not read. And then, Years and years passed, and in fourth grade, I had this amazing teacher. Her name was Mrs. Graham, and she would go deep sea diving in the summers. And so in our Oklahoma classroom, she would bring back shells and starfish, and there were even sharks in jars in our class, and it was amazing. And Mrs. Graham realized something about me, that I was dyslexic. And she said, we're going to create something called an IEP, an Individual Education Plan, and we're going we're gonna to make this work. So when the other students were reworking on words like, um, oh golly, encyclopedia, I got words like cat and sat. And when I got those words right, my teacher wrote this big letter A right on top of my paper in red ink, and I felt so great about myself. And then one day, she was writing out my report card, and I, I, I reversed two letters. I, my name is McCandless, little c, big c, not McCandless, big c, little c but I had her write it wrong, and we came home with that report card. My dad saw it, and he was very angry at my teacher and began writing very horrible comments about a teacher who doesn't even know how to write a name correctly. And I couldn't let that happen. She was a good teacher. So he said, I'm sorry, Dad, but it was my fault. I'm the one who told her to write it that way. So he picked up this bit pink resin hairbrush that was on my table, and I don't know if you remember resin hairbrushes. They were really a hit in the 70s. They were really heavy. And they were especially heavy on the face of a 10-year-old child. So I walked to school crying. And I got there, and I told my teacher, I'm sorry, I have a welt on my face. Because my dad hit me, and he hits me a lot. And she gave me a Kleenex, and she told me to wash my face and come back to class. Nothing happened. I, I wondered, was I not clear? Or maybe this is normal. Maybe this is the way children are treated. But I learned that day to stop, stop talking to adults about this, because nothing changes. And a few weeks later, we would get professionals in my class. Sometimes it'd be a firefighter, sometimes a dentist that teaches how to brush our teeth. But a few weeks later, we got a police officer. And he came in with these little note cards that were called hotline number cards. And he said, I'm giving you this. And anyone in this classroom, if you ever have a point where the abuse in your life becomes too much, call this number. And I took the card home, and I hid it in my dresser. And it would sit in my dresser for the next seven years, till one day when I thought the abuse became too much when my father threatened to kill our whole family, that's when I called the number. I still have that card today. I still have it within my heart. And I embrace the idea that there comes a point in every life when you must call the number, when the abuse is so much that you can no longer let failure occur. But I didn't embrace this story sufficiently to save my husband. In March of 2009, my husband was suffering pain. He went to the doctor many, many times. He went to an ER twice. By the mid-March of 2009, my husband had been on four types of pain medications, two types of muscle relaxants, and four types of laxatives, and we still didn't have a diagnosis. He was hospitalized on March 25 for some tests. On March 27th of 2009, he was told while he was alone by his oncologist he had tumors and growths throughout his abdomen. The oncologist then left town for a medical conference for the next four days and would be unreachable by cell phone or email. 
my in-laws and I would scurry all over the hospital asking questions, what's going on, what's happening, what's diagnosis, what's treatment plan, what are the next steps? And the oncologist came back a few days later and he went up to my husband at 7.30 rounds and said, Mr. Holiday, I was wondering, um, I understand your wife's been asking questions about your case. And I, my husband just looked at him and was a little worried and he said, yes. And the doctor said, well, if Mrs. Holiday, Miss little A-type personality has questions, she should come to my office hours to ask them. And I did, and this is a painting of that day. He never closed the door. He never stopped taking phone calls. He never stopped talking to that one nurse about that parking lot problem in the one parking space and that one employee who parks in the wrong space in the lot, or Miss Rosen's chemotherapy transfer later that day. And all the while, he's speaking so rapidly and saying words I don't understand. So I say, please, please, could you slow down because I'm writing these words down so I can, I can research them online. And he says, I don't like people who research online. I said, I'm sorry, but my only way to understand you is to research because I don't have a background in medicine. He said, that's right. I'm the one with the medical degree. This went on for weeks and weeks. And we didn't have access to information. And finally, we transferred to another facility with an out-of-date and incomplete medical record and transfer summary. It was horrible. He was denied care for six hours while they tried to cobble together a medical record using a phone and a fax machine. And a few weeks later, I met this man. I met Dr. Ted at a Health 2.0 meeting where there were bar charts and graphs and people like you, and we were all talking about statistics and aggregate data, and at 3.15, I got a talk. I got to talk about what it felt like right now to have my husband in hospice, how we fought and fought for information. And everything stopped, and everyone stopped talking, and it became real, and Ted said, Ted said what was the worst thing that happened? Of all the horrible things that happened, what was the worst? And I said was lack of access to information. My husband died on June 17th of 2009. And I began to blog and tweet and Facebook and paint. This is a 20 by 50 foot painting in Washington, D.C. and it's about our medical care. And it's called 73 cents. And it changes minds and gets people thinking about how the world could be if we embrace this failure and make it better. So what did I learn? What did I learn from our three great failures? You must be able to read. Never give up asking if something can change, if we can make this better. Don't hide when things are going wrong. And finally, we must communicate openly and often. You see, if you tell the story, it changes things. When I look at patient care in this nation, I look and see a system like child abuse in the 1980s. What am I? I'm Little Miss A-type personality, right? That's painting a negative space. See, I didn't paint the letter A. I painted the border around it. And we must appreciate the text and the borders. See, I met Ted at this amazing event. I saw him at Kaiser Permanente's first opening of the Center for Total Health. And it was beautiful and spectacular. And when we got into that space, I said, Ted, we should have a gallery show in here. And he said, no way. They're not going to put nails on these walls. And I said, yes, 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 let's do it. We can, what we can do, we can, we can put art on our backs. We can walk in person. And that's what we did. See, Ted and I became the wall that walks. 54 other individuals joined us to this day. And then, to this point, there are 187 walkers all throughout the nation. We walked that day and became part of an amazing story. See, we learned something. We learned how to grok failure. Grok's like one of my favorite words of all time, and it means something very simple. It means we must embrace the thing that sometimes harms us. We make it make a part of us. The observer becomes the observed. And so Ted and I, we want to completely embrace that. We want to stop bouncing our balls alone. We want to become a part of a future that might include failure, but at least we're trying to bounce the ball together.